the right therapist versus the wrong therapist. The right therapist. I am not a believer in blanket advice that in the blanket advice that therapy is a cure-all in general and especially not for people who have been in a narcissistically abusive relationship. Rather, I believe that the right therapy from the right therapist or life coach can be incredibly helpful, but unfortunately, finding that can sometimes feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Just like in, in any other profession, not all therapy or therapists are created equal. And also, like in any other area of life, there is an ocean of difference between theory and application, between studying something and actually living it. <clears throat> Frankly, I'm not sure how much about the dynamics of abuse are even studied or taught, which is absolutely mind-boggling to me. If a therapist does not understand the difference between an abusive relationship and a normal relationship, that abuse is about power and control, that abuse is not about gender or strength, the different types of abuse, how power and control are manipulated and used against a person, the differences between an, an individual issue and a relationship issue, and the differences between commitment and codependency or trauma bonds, then they are giving out nothing more than well-intended bad advice. <clears throat> an abusive relationship has more in common with a hostage with a hostage situation or a cult than a relationship. And to not be familiar with the dynamics of manipulation and trauma bonds is to not be familiar or helpful at all with what's going on. What I have seen a lot of and have experienced is well-intended therapists who have their own unexamined biases and codependency, or sometimes even narcissism issues and who are not familiar with the dynamics of abuse to the degree they need to be in order to actually be effective. What I have seen from a lot of therapists who aren't familiar with abuse is that they don't want their clients to talk about this abusive or controlling person, and instead they want them to focus on themselves. And I can understand that. I really can. After all, we only have control over ourselves. However, there is a time and place in healing for the focus to shift from what happened to understanding our part in things. A big part of understanding and healing from narcissistic abuse comes from pulling apart the damage done and examining things piece by piece in an effort to make sense of what in the hell happened. Because this isn't a relationship, it's a manipulationship. And when a person's been manipulated, they often don't realize it until the very end. When they do realize it, it's incredibly painful and troubling to wonder how you didn't see what was going on for so long. They need to get that validation and clarity before they can effectively move forward into the next stage of healing. It's a lot like being in a cult. The trauma and confusion of it all, that doesn't end when the person leaves the cult. Oh, that doesn't end when the person leaves the cult. They have to untangle the dynamics of how they got sucked into one, why they stayed, re-examine their belief system, sort out how they were being manipulated, and learn to trust again. It's a lot to go through, and this takes time. What a person needs the most when they are fresh out of a narcissistically abusive relationship, or any trauma for that matter, is to feel validated, safe, believed, listened to, and empowered to continue finding their voice in all this. So it's very normal that when a person gets out of these kinds of situations that they will want to research into narcissism and manipulation and rehash or ruminate about this topic. And this can go on for months or even years. Again, this is because they weren't in a bad relationship. They've been held emotionally hostage. And there's, an off there's often a lot of PTSD that goes along with that. It's not helpful to try and stop them from researching or rehashing things. And it is also not helpful to encourage them to date again. What's helpful is to listen to them and to give them the time they need to put together the pieces of this puzzle that they are finding. When this starts to happen, then and only then can they begin to process this trauma into a cohesive and understandable series of events that makes sense. Because this researching phase can last for quite a while, and because people do have so many questions about what happened, I think it's incredibly helpful for people to be around others who have gone through the same thing. I am a strong believer that the best combination out there to get people the clarity, validation, and understanding they need is to have both a support group as well as a good therapist or life coach who is familiar with narcissistic abuse, 
where a person can take their aha moments from the support group and explore them in individual therapy. Now, don't get me wrong. The right therapist can be worth their weight in gold, but the wrong therapist can cost a person lots of time, money, and emotional hurt and heartache, not to mention potentially revictimizing them and doing even more harm. I don't think that many people, including many therapists, fully realize just how much harm they can do, especially with well-intended bad advice. The right therapist is one who understands the difference between a relationship and an abusive relationship, has in-depth working knowledge and experience with emotional and psychological abuse, you feel reasonably comfortable opening up to. You probably won't at first, and that's okay. Open up at the pace you feel comfortable with. After a rapport is built, you feel safe doing a deep dive on certain highly emotional and deeply personal topics. Understands that it is normal and healthy to have deal breaker behavior and that going no contact with someone, even if they are family, is sometimes what a person needs in order to heal. Doesn't have their identity, ego, or religion wrapped up in fixing you or your relationship. You feel this person believes you and is on your side. Understands the difference between a communication issue and a personality disorder. Encourages you to explore other resources. Recognizes the value in a support group slash additional resources. The wrong therapist. The wrong therapist is one who isn't familiar with abuse or that you are having to educate them on what an abusive relationship is. Isn't familiar with the seven different types of abuse or only recognizes physical abuse as being problematic. <clears throat> Thinks that both people had an equal part in this relationship, or that there is some sort of excuse for the abuse, such as the abuser's childhood or communication issues, etc. Is unable to tell the difference between a normal relationship and an abusive relationship. You aren't comfortable opening up to. Gets annoyed or frustrated that you aren't moving on. You feel this person doesn't believe you or that you don't feel they're on your side. Minimizes, invalidates, or discounts verbal, emotional, or psychological abuse. Corrects your use of terminology, telling you that what you experienced wasn't abuse or that being verbally, emotionally, or psychologically abused is somehow normal. Tells you that no one is perfect and pushes you to reconcile after you've experienced something that you feel is deal-breaking behavior. Thinks that family is forever and that family members should always keep in contact no matter what. Thinks that everything can be fixed given enough time, understanding, love, religion, or rehab. Is in any way abusive or abrasive. Minimizes, invalidates, or discounts what you went through. Does not understand trauma or CPTSD and how it affects a person mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and or physically you become attracted to or who you feel is attracted to you. <clears throat> New story. I thought all therapists were about the same and picked one because she took my insurance. I stayed seeing her for close to a year and felt re-victimized the whole time. Hindsight being what it is, it was very clear that she wasn't familiar with abuse, but I just assu assumed she'd be able to help because she was a therapist. At the time, I didn't even realize I had been abused. I just knew something was very wrong with me and that I felt like I was going crazy. It wasn't until I got into a support group that I realized my mother was psychologically and emotionally abusive. I knew then that I was wasting my time and money with that therapist and needed to find a new one. It took a few phone calls to some other therapists and asking them if they were familiar about abuse and what abuse was to them and how they felt about me not talking to my abusive mother before I was able to find one that could help. I'm so glad I found one that gets it now and who has been able to help guide me to more solid emotional ground. It's really made a difference. Lisa. Choosing the right partner versus choosing a partner who is the opposite of your ex. Choosing the right partner. Choosing the right partner involves knowing ourselves to the point where we know what we would want and what we don't want, and loving ourselves enough to think we are worthy of good people and things in our life, as well as that we are worthy as well as that we are worth walking away from people and things that cause us hurt and harm. Loving ourselves also includes realizing that we don't need to stick around to make sure questionable behavior is indeed problematic and that they really are lying, cheating, stealing, or otherwise abusing us, 
And instead realizing that if it's questionable or if we aren't comfortable with how we are being treated, then we value ourselves enough to walk away. The right partner is one who treats us with dignity and respect, is trustworthy, doesn't have continually squirrely or hurtful behavior, and has open, honest, sincere, and solutions-oriented communication. Choosing the right partner and getting into the right relationship starts with getting into the right relationship with ourselves. Choosing a partner who is the opposite of your ex. Choosing a partner who is the opposite of their ex is what many people tend to do. On the surface, this makes sense. So, for example, if your ex was arrogant, selfish, and verbally abusive, it's very common and understandable for a person to never want to be tangled up with someone like that again. So they might find themselves attracted to, relationship-wise or even friendship-wise, someone who is the complete opposite. However, the complete opposite of an overt narcissist tends to be a love-bombing, sweet-talking, fast-moving, charming, covert narcissist. If a person doesn't realize that love-bombing, moving fast, future-faking, and superficial charms are red flags, or if they have unexamined or unresolved vulnerabilities within themselves, such as being lonely or scared, low self-esteem, a blurred sense of what healthy boundaries are, including thinking that everything is workable and not having a clear line for deal-breaker behavior until things get really, really bad, then they are unknowingly primed to get tangled up with a covert abuser. And when the reality of this relationship comes crashing down, this person will most likely feel that they are cursed, or that there are no good people out there, or that they get caught up in another spiral, sh uh, or they get caught up in another spiral of shame or self-doubt, wondering what on earth is wrong with them, how this could have happened again, and are terrified to date or even get to know new people. Interestingly enough, dating or befriending the opposite kind of person works the other way around as well. A lot of people who have been involved with a charming, covert abuser have found themselves attracted to someone who has more outright problematic behavior. Perhaps they do this because on a subconscious level, they might feel a certain sense of security in knowing that at least they know what this partner's issues are and what they can expect from them versus a covert abuser whose behavior alternates between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at any moment, or who may go for long periods of time acting like a decent or even great partner up until their double life kind of behavior, siphoning funds, cheating, etc., comes to light. <clears throat> New story. My last relationship was with a very controlling, arrogant, jealous, mean man who continually put me down. So when I came across Sam... I fell hard for him. Sam was everything my ex wasn't. He was seemingly kind, compassionate, attentive, and supportive. Things moved fast, and I felt like I'd met my soulmate. We were married within the year. And then I discovered that he was cheating, and that he had lied about a lot of major things. I fully believe he married me because I had money, and he wanted me to support him. And when I didn't, that's when things began to go south with us. I realize now that he was just as abusive as my ex, but in a different way. I vowed to never date anyone like my ex again, and I really thought I'd be able to steer clear of a snake like him. And so when I came across Prince Charming, I thought this was what love was supposed to be. I never thought in a million years that if a man comes along like Prince Charming that this is also a big red flag. Sandra. Needing someone in your life versus wanting someone in your life needing someone in your life. When we chronically need someone in our life, especially if that person is damaging to us, this is a sign of a deeper issue and one that is important for us to explore and resolve. This level of neediness is very common in an abusive relationship and it's formed through intermittent reinforcement and trauma bonds. However, <clears throat> if we tend to have a pattern of making someone else our whole world, thinking that they complete us, then this is what codependency, also often referred to as love addiction, looks like in action. Many people who have this type of thinking tend to go from relationship to relationship, being fearful of or hating, being alone or single, settling for crumbs of affection, attention, or loyalty, and trying to convince themselves that a toxic relationship or friendship is somehow good enough. 
While it is completely normal to want or need love and validation, it is abnormal to feel that sick intensity and obsession that is associated with love addiction or to seek it from people who are abusive. Being in love with someone and being addicted to love or to them are two very different things, and it's important that we are able to tell them apart. So yes, companionship, relationships, and friendships are an enjoyable and rewarding part of life but only if they are with people who actually treat us with dignity and respect. Anything less and we feel drained, exhausted, perpetually confused, anxious, depressed, nervous, distrusting, and overall unhappy. The great irony in this is that we, if, if we are holding on to relationships that don't nourish us because we think crumbs are better than nothing, we will continually find ourselves with a string of failed relationships and friendships because these dynamics were forged from a place of fear and scarcity and not from a place of self-love and abundance. If you are finding yourself continually trying to justify your worth to someone or walking on eggshells in order to earn their love or loyalty, then there's a problem. If you feel jealous, nervous, insecure, anxious, distrusting of them, and in a scramble to keep them around no matter what they do, then this is a problem. If you feel like you are in competition with other people for their affection and attention, then this is a problem. If you have to sacrifice your dignity or respect in order to keep this relationship together, then this is a problem. You are worth more than crumbs. Wanting someone in your life. Wanting someone in your life means that you are approaching relationships and friendships from an attitude of abundance and self-love. You have a life full of friends and hobbies and you aren't looking for a relationship to make you feel loved or to fill a deep void. Loving yourself means having healthy boundaries, making your self-care a priority, and treating yourself, and expecting to be treated, with dignity, respect, and value, and to be okay with walking away or distancing yourself from others who treat you with anything less. New story. It took me a while to realize that I had a hard time being single. I was boy crazy since I can remember and continually bounced from one relationship to the next. I didn't realize it then, but I needed to be in a relationship in order to feel love. Because I didn't know how to love myself. Now I have friends and hobbies, and when I date, it's not out of desperation or a need for someone else to validate me. It's because I enjoy that person, and I appreciate having them in my life. If they were to leave, sure I'd be upset. But they are no longer my whole world, and my life would go on. Ava. You do have to absolutely believe you deserve to be loved and validated. Just because you exist, then you deserve to be loved and validated. If you are finding yourself in a desperate scramble to try and cling tighter, try harder, work harder, trying to earn their love or to be treated with respect, and continually confused as to why you can't trust them, when in reality they are not safe people to trust, then you are in a one-sided relationship. If you are not being loved and validated, then you have to learn how to let go, leave, and look elsewhere. Lucy. Gut instinct versus hypervigilance. Gut instinct. Our gut instinct speaks to us through our emotions, which we often refer to as red flags. These red flags serve as an early warning sign of potential danger, and unfortunately, are warning signs that many of us ignore. When we ignore a red flag, it's generally for one of five different reasons. Red flags aren't seen, they are felt, and because we don't see anything obviously wrong, we feel the need to stick around until we have more proof and are actually proven right that this person or situation is indeed problematic. We don't want to be seen as overreacting if we take action without an overwhelming amount of concrete evidence that points to there being actual danger. We don't want to be embarrassed or seen as rude, weird, difficult, or overreacting by others if we don't have proof that something is wrong. We aren't taught to give red flags the significance that they deserve. Instead, we are taught that they are more of a vibe or a feeling and to not make decisions based on feelings. We have an emotional investment in staying in the red flag situation. In addition, the more you have become aware, sorry, the more you become aware of what manipulative or abusive behavior looks like, your feelings about what you're experiencing will move from being hard to place red flags to outright deal breakers. 
This might make you feel a mix of being both empowered, because you saw the bullet and dodged it, as well as feel a little crazy if no one else sees the problem for what it is. Learning to tune in to your emotions is critical and will help you to better avoid problematic people and situations in the future. Therefore, I'm going to cover each of the previously mentioned points in a bit more depth with the hopes of getting you to give those red flags the weight they deserve. In order to better understand our gut instincts so we can take them seriously, it can be helpful to understand how the human brain processes information. Our brain takes in a tremendous amount of information all the time, and our brain's primary job is to make meaning out of all that information. In addition, it's important to realize that while we have what looks like one brain, it's really three brains that have evolved over time to form one brain. We have a reptile or primitive brain, an emotional brain, the limbic system, and a logic and reasoning prefrontal cortex part of our brain. Where most of us go wrong is in thinking that we only, and only need to, use our logic and reasoning part of our brain to make all of our decisions. This is not the case. In fact, our brains process information from the bottom up and not the top down, meaning all that information first passes through the reptile brain, which sorts the information based on what we either need to do, fight or flight, or what we could do, feed, breed, rest, or digest. Once meaning is assigned to this new information, it passes up to our second brain, our limbic system. This part of our brain is the largest part and connects to the base of our brainstem to the vagus nerve, which runs from our brainstem to our rectum and touches pretty much every major organ in between. So when we have a visceral reaction to something, meaning we become nauseated, get a stomach ache, urinate in fear, become repelled, or feel our heart start to race, it's because our limbic system is preparing us to act on that fight or flight mechanism that was kicked off by the reptile brain. Our logic and thinking brain is the final filter, and only a small portion of the information that was originally taken in by the brain reaches this level. If we think of our body in terms of being a vehicle, then the reptile brain is both the gas and the brake pedal. The limbic system is the GPS system, and the logic and reasoning brain is the steering wheel. If any one of these components is missing, a person will not be able to navigate through life effectively. In order for it to do this, it initially filters the information based on some pretty basic questions. The first major question being, will this kill me? If our fight or flight filter isn't triggered, then our brain filters information based on whether or not we could breed, feed, friend with this information. And if not, then our brain may register that it's time for us to rest or digest. Keep in mind that all of this is being done at a subconscious level. The last point with our gut instinct is that if you listen to it and take action early enough to avoid the problem, you will actually avoid the problem, meaning you will rarely have the validation of concrete proof that you did in fact avoid the problem because you avoided it early enough. News story. I am an engineer and I never gave a lot of credit to my gut instinct. I always felt that if I didn't have solid proof that somebody was cheating, lying, or stealing, then I needed to stay in a relationship until I knew for sure. Now I realize that we have gut instincts for a reason and I take them seriously. I no longer hang in until the bitter end to have my gut instinct to be, uh, be proven right. If it feels off to me, it's because odds are something is off and the world is too big and too full of people who don't have squirrely behavior for me to spend time on those who do. Betsy. Hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is the feeling of being continually on edge. It is part of our fight or flight defense and is a healthy and normal response to problematic behavior. When it becomes unhealthy or problematic is when we can't turn it off and remain in a state of cat-like readiness, ready to run at any time. It is normal to feel on alert and on guard around people who are acting in squirrely or suspicious ways. This is where trusting your judgment comes into play because you may reach out for validation from others who may or may not be able to see the problematic behavior that you are seeing. Not because it isn't necessarily there, but perhaps because their idea of what is problematic is much more overt and tangible. It takes time and practice to trust your judgment, but once you do, you will feel incredibly empowered. After you get out of a narcissistically abusive relationship, especially one where there was a lot of covert abuse, such as emotional and psychological 
especially gaslighting and projection, you may seriously begin to wonder if you are crazy or in the process of becoming crazy. You may feel really on edge and distrusting of people and situations that never made you distrusting before. And you may find yourself continually questioning what normal behavior is and what is a normal way to feel. While all of these feelings are a normal part of CPTSD or CPTSD type symptoms that occur after an emotional trauma, they're also a very normal part of increasing your awareness and realizing that there is a whole other layer of danger and dangerous people out in the world that you previously weren't aware could ever be a threat. Feeling hypervigilant versus seeing problematic behavior for what it is. Feeling hypervigilant. Feeling hypervigilant often feels like a perpetual state of fight or flight, which feels like being in a state of cat-like readiness for seemingly no reason. Feeling hypervigilant and having your defenses up after you've been through the emotional rock tumbler that is a narcissistically abusive relationship is normal. It's normal to be on edge and to start seeing problematic or abusive behavior almost every time you turn around. This is in part because you might be hypervigilant due to the emotional trauma, but it's also in large part because you are starting to see problematic or abusive behavior or situations for what they are, for perhaps the first time. Seeing problematic behavior for what it is. Seeing problematic behavior for what it is can really be its own level of crazy making and can feel like you have entered the Mad Hatter's Tea Party and no one seems to see problematic behavior for what it is. Everyone seems to participate in all of this madness and they might be looking at you like you're the one with the problem for thinking anything is wrong. This is because the vast majority of people out there are not aware of what exactly manipulative abusive behavior is let alone the initial stages of how it happens. And this includes not just friends and family, but it can and often does include police, therapists, social workers, attorneys, and judges. And odds are that when you wake up to what problematic behavior is, you will want to try to tell everyone about what you've learned about abuse and abusive behavior, because you want to get validation. You also want them to become aware of the danger so they can avoid it too. I will tell you from experience that most other people won't understand what you're trying to say, especially if they haven't experienced anything remotely like it. And trying to get them to wake up to it is a lot like putting lipstick on a pig. It will frustrate you and it will annoy them. At first, you may feel really unsettled by just how many people don't seem to see that there is a problem. And this may make you wonder if perhaps you really are making a big deal out of things, or if you are being too judgmental, harsh, bitter, or jaded from your past experiences. As time progresses and you realize that the red flags you were seeing really were there, you might feel like you have a superpower, like some sort of hidden insight into human behavior. But again, the reality is that most people don't live in reality. They live in a heavily rationalized reality based on either what they think is reasonable, even if reality doesn't match up and their being reasonable puts them in harm's way, or what they want reality to be. You will become more comfortable in time with your judgment, the more you use it, and it is okay to err on the side of caution. You don't need to explain yourself to anyone. News story. After I got out of an abusive marriage, I was very anxious and on edge and terrified of being hurt again. When I started dating again, I kept seeing red flags in people and all my friends kept saying that I was making a big deal out of nothing. After a few brief relationships with men that also turned out to be abusive, controlling, jealous, or cheating, I finally decided that I wasn't making too big a deal out of those red flags and that I needed to trust my gut, even if no one else agreed with me. Josephine I have learned to keep my mouth shut, and if I can't, then I discuss it with my therapist or a forum. People seem to... Ha- People seem to have to wake up to this stuff on their own. And if you try to discuss it with someone who is not at least somewhat awake and aware, they just think you are a little bit crazy. Also, in most cases, the people I was trying to alert were actually disordered themselves. So, of course, they did not want to hear about it or discuss it. They were very interested in getting me to drop it, stop talking about it, and above all, go back to sleep. The people who actually get angry about it are usually disordered or dysfunctional themselves, and it is always in their best interest for you to shut up and stop talking about these things. 
because it means the risk of their own exposure has just gotten exponentially greater. Most normal people don't get upset with others setting a boundary, and worst case, they might just think you are a little bit off your rocker. But setting a boundary with an abusive person? Oh boy, watch out. Lucy.